Welcome to Legacy 21st, an online summit of arts and ideas on organizing 50 years after King. I'm Isis Sarabe, Artistic Director of the March on Washington Film Festival, and we're happy to have you for this conversation. April 2018 is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. In the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement used a number of tactics to push racial justice in the United States, from freedom marches and sit-ins to rallies and boycotts. These were tactics that were well-planned and thought out, not at all haphazard or accidental. So where are we now? What are the tactics and tools we're using in the 21st century and where are the new front lines. In this summit, we'll be speaking with a number of people who are expert in their fields to find out what their work entails and how they're moving, organizing forward. So with me is Urban Revitalization Strategist, I tried to get that word right, Revitalization Strategist and Real Estate Developer and MacArthur Fellow, Majora Carter. Welcome, Majora. Hey, thanks for having me. Great. So let's get right into it. Right. Now, I remember a while back hearing about this fire starter sister who was making stuff happen in the South Bronx and then heard about sustainable South Bronx. So tell us about that. What was that and what need were you addressing when you started that? Well, first of all, thank you. I like being called a fire starter. Yeah, uh, but anyway, uh, Sustainable South Bronx was my response to helping to do not just do social advocacy in our community, but to actually do project-based solutions to some of the environmental and economic issues that we experienced as a community. So tell me now, what were some of the steps that you took to build support, both in the community and with civic organizations, the government, and other stakeholders? Well, much of the projects that we work on, worked on came directly from listening to people in my, other, in my past career working in community development. And so it became clear that what we really needed to do was create projects around that. So we really looked, no matter if it was creating a green job, training and placement systems, or transforming a dump into a park, or creating, uh, or actually facilitating the first mobile fabrication laboratory to come to the South Bronx. It was all about express needs that the community experienced for job creation, for a healthier environment, for economic development, uh, for thinking forward, forwardly about what kind of careers there were, you know, within the future. So the idea for us was like how, knowing this, how do we create also um, alliances with our elected officials, you know, with the people that are already in the community, with businesses. We all, we really focused on not being so single-minded that we literally couldn't think about who do we need to partner with in order to facilitate the goals of, of our mission. So first I want to ask you, what is a mobile fabrication lab? Oh, and then... Oh. Tell me, what exact steps did you take? We're in the age now where organizing to people means retweeting something or posting it on Facebook. Yeah. But I know that organizing is real step-by-step -step retail work. So first, fabrication, and then that. So the easy one, a, a mobile fabric, a fabrication laboratory is basically, you know, you essentially have a computer program that's linked to various different types of fabrication machines. And once you know how to design the program, you can literally make make up these these uh, projects pretty quickly. So whether it's wood or through resin or whatever kind of project. So we had all of that equipment in an old NASCAR trailer. Wow. So people in our communities could actually experience what it was like to take an idea from, you know, from their, from their, from their mind to, to work a computer program around it so that then it would, the, the program would be translated into a material product. So that was a really exciting thing to do. Um, the interesting thing about organizing for us is that um, there are many different ways to do it because I do think that now, especially, you know, it, because it is so, it's become, I think, sort of this idea that it's so simplistic and there's only one way to do it. Um, you know, which is again, where we, when I started my work, um, it did seem as though I was an outlier in a bunch of ways because I wasn't focusing on advocacy. I wasn't, you know, the, so the whole world of social media right now is, is sort of bizarre to me in a bunch of different ways in part because what we do for organizing is literally 
about creating uh, experiences in the real world for people to connect and build their own lives, their own community um, in ways that I don't think you can only do through obviously a tweet. You have to build it out. So being project based was our way that we decided to focus on organizing just as valid as straight up organizing you know, it, or, or advocacy in any other way. So just take me back a little bit. What was the scene? I mean, the reputation back then in the South Bronx was, you know, hell on earth. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. But what were the needs that you saw? So many of the needs, you know, were there was an environmental justice crisis that was going on. The city was planning on building huge waste facilities in the community, even though we already handled an enormous amount of the, the city's waste. So that in and of itself was the scene that I kind of came back into, because again, this was my hometown. So it was just a matter of, I came out of college and grad school and came back home and, and, and walked right back into it. And, but for when we, when we realized that there was all, there were these lots of different advocacy organizations that were working on it. And yet it felt like there was a lot of attention being put on it, but there weren't like very specific issues that were being addressed. So again, we knew what we were fighting for, Yes. But, or excuse me, we knew what we were fighting against, yeah. but yeah. we didn't know what we were fighting for. And that's where we kind of decided to move in that direction of providing, literally, how do you put meat on the bones of a community's hopes and dreams for its own future? Mm -hmm. Like, again, I, I get that we need to fight and advocate for all sorts of things. But again, we also need to have the kind of communities that we want to stay in. So that it's actually worth fighting for, you know, which, which is basically that whole idea has kind of led me into the work that I do now, almost 20 years later, in real estate development. Yeah. So before we get to that, because I'm seeing the real transition from your growth from then to now, what were some of the obstacles that you faced or some of the misconceptions people had about your work and what was needed? Um, <laughs> you know, it was, again, very interesting because being you know, a part at that time, a part of the social justice industrial complex, I think that there was this feeling that there really was only one way to do the work, so to speak. And, you know, it's all tried and true. It's like there is, you know, particular protests, you know, there's definitely some advocacy, but as far as building things, that was kind of left outside for people to, so that we could inform them. Mm -hmm. not so that we would do it ourselves. And I thought that, that there was always something a little weird about that, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember when we first started working on doing uh, actually green jobs training and, and placement, because we knew if we we're talking about environmental restoration, you know, these are our communities that need to be restored. How are we involved in that restoration? Not just from you know, talking about this needs to happen, but also from actually doing the work. And so do we have a personal and financial stake in the development and the redevelopment and restoration of our own communities? And, and I do remember, you know, some, some, first of all, first of all, those people didn't even know what we were talking about. It was like, that's just crazy pants. Um, how, why would you train people to do that? But probably one of the more hurtful and, um, bizarre things I ever heard was that we were training people to be, to be field hands. And, and I thought that is possibly one of the more offensive things I've ever heard in my entire life. But, but they were thinking it was like, Oh, you know, you're just basically telling people to dig in the dirt as opposed to understanding what, that there actually was a trajectory, you know, within the career of environmental restoration. And if we bothered to take a look at it, we would realize that that is the first step toward reclaiming and restoring our own communities, like knowing that they're burdened, but also being a part of their restoration. So besides the work itself, what had to happen was changing people's thinking, expanding their understanding of what this means. It's not just cleaning an empty lot. It yeah. was much more than that. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I often find that we don't necessarily, I mean, I think as, as, as a culture, those of us who, you know, um, are focused on social justice and social growth in that in that way, because it, it does seem somewhat uh, very siloed in terms of how we decide we're going to do things. Like for example, I couldn't when we worked on environmental development and restoration, it became really clear how closely that our the environmental degradation of our community was linked to the economic 
degradation of our communities. Yes. And Same one. Absolutely no way I could think about one without thinking about the other. So of course we had to think about job creation. Of course we had to think about business development and how do you bring it together within our own communities so that we are actually the beneficiaries of it as we are also the, the co-creators of it. And um, so that in and of itself was also kind of like a, well, you know, I think there's often, you know, within, you know, many of the, the circles that, that do this work that there's, something unseemly about the prospect of making money. Yes. And, and talking about it. And, and I'm like, hmm. I'm sorry, you know, within a, a country where the, the health and well being of people of color in particular and black people in, in particular mm -hmm. um, is actually so tied to their lack of economic well being. I think we can't talk about, social equality without talking about economic equality. Is it possible to give an example of where you are in the South Bronx of the tie between the two? Sure. Um, yeah. So part of the work, so again, I really do feel like the work that I started in, in the environmental yeah. field really absolutely helped fuel what I do right now in terms of where we needed to go and sort of like the foundation in which it was built. Because again, an environmentally uh, uh, degraded community, chances are it will also be economically right. ravaged. And mm -hmm. so since we saw both of those things, and then and of course socially uh, degraded as well, since we saw both of those things happening in the same place, we realized that so much of what was, was happening here was that we were expecting you know, the idea that people from communities like ours, um, born and raised here, that we're setting up an expectation for them to just assume that you need to grow up. And if you're going to do, do something great in the world, you have to leave the, this community. Yes. You have to. And, and it's, it's assumed. I mean, I happen to be one of those, those kids. I was one of the bright ones. And it was just like, of course, you're going to grow up and be somebody who went to college and you're going to move away. And it was just like, you bet your bippy I am. <laughs> and that's what I did. I was planning my escape from the time I was seven years old. Yeah. And nobody blamed me. Um, but, and, but then the more I realized that, you know, so much of what we do right now is based on the way real estate development happens in these communities. Like we're almost expecting these communities to stay impoverished. We see that from the type of housing policy that comes here. We yeah. see it from the type of economic development, development policies that happen here. Mm -hmm. And also the type of environmental policies that are enacted in communities yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. And so when we realized that there was an opportunity here to kind of like honestly look at some of the unintended consequences of the civil rights movement that made it so that people through federal housing policy, you know, which had of course a lot more complicated than that, but basically it gave people that were in formally racially segregated communities, the right and the opportunity to move to other communities. So again, before one point we were racially uh, segregated, but economically diverse. And when housing policy made it so that people could actually move, the people who did that were more of the economically mobile ones. Yeah. And what was and so we didn't have in those those really economically diverse communities where we had you know a, the daughter of a black janitor, you know, seeing you know a, a black doctor. Exactly. And it was possible. And instead, what we're still dealing with to the to this day is the impact of having these not only racially segregated communities, but right. also economically segregated communities and policies that exacerbate that, that phenomenon. And through real estate development, we realized that we could create, a, use it as a socially, economically, and environmentally transformational tool by building strategically and with great intention uh, yeah. mixed use and uh, mixed use economic developments, including mixed uh, income housing. When we were speaking earlier in preparation for this, you had an interesting remark about the deserts. We were talking about food deserts. Ah. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. say that again, because it has a lot to do with what you were saying before about mindset. Yeah. We started talking oh. about food deserts. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, Boy, it's a really, it, yeah, I'm, okay, great. You're going to get me into all sorts of trouble here. That's okay. I, I'm a fire starter, so that's what I do. See, I told you. <laughs> yeah. 
guilty as charged. Mm -hmm. So, so there is, I think, in the sort of the very popular um, vernacular in in the social justice world, this idea of food deserts. And whereas I absolutely do believe, on some level, on a lot of levels, a decade ago, it was very common for it to be nearly impossible to find healthy and affordable produce in many communities, yes. uh, low status communities around the country. No offense. I remember that. that. I love the little trick that a lot of grocery stores would pull. They have like a little styrofoam package, and then they put the um, fruit or, or fruit or vegetables in it and then put it in plastic wrap and yes. then went and open it up. The bottom part would be rotten. Yes. 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 I remember that. that. Totally true. Or walking into a store and not finding anything fresh anything. anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. we have, well, that was absolutely true in many, many cases. And I, and I can speak specifically for the South Bronx in the area that I'm in right now. Um, but I think there's been a lot of work for food justice activists. You know, we've been talking a lot about access and if people just had access to healthy fruit, food, it'd be awesome. Um, and, and that would be great. And that would solve everything. Um, but the, now people are still talking about these food deserts as if they're actually, as if they actually exist. And the bottom, you know, I can walk literally a, a block away from my house and find, you know, a really good grocery store that literally took out an aisle in order to make way for an expanded produce section. And it's really good. Um, um, there's a food box program that's subsidized. You get awesome, awesome fruits and vegetables. And it's all within the same community. Yeah. However, both the grocer and, and the, the food box people will talk about how, you know, they're actually, their numbers aren't as great as they could be considering the size of the community. Right. And so that, and so when we, we kind of question the idea of like, do we really have food deserts or do we have demand deserts? Mm -hmm. Are people actually in wanting or desiring of more healthy and, and fresh produce? And are they actually doing, buying it with their dollars? Yeah. Are they voting with their dollars that way? And, you know, and I realized that we don't have a $200 sneaker desert here. You can buy plenty of those because people will buy them more. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and I really appreciate the fact that despite that, that the fact that demand has not caught up with, with much with the, uh, the demand for, say, sneakers in this community for, for fresh food, you know, there's still folks that are out there doing it because they're hoping that it'll go forward. So the idea that there is this, this only food deserts doesn't, I think, give um, credit to the work that's actually already been done because yes. we have pushed the needle in terms of making sure that we have fresh uh, and accessible food within our community that's of much better quality than we had less than a decade ago. But I still think the narrative that, that people like to tell themselves and tell, I think, philanthropy, frankly, is that, you know, we're still in desperate need and we need more taken, be, be taken care of in this regard. And it's just like, no, um, yeah. that's, I, I, come, I don't really come from a, uh, that kind of place. I want to be in a position where it's, we can be really pushing the idea of what we need and what we want, but do it in a way that actually, I think, brings a lot more honor and dignity you know, to us and assumes that we can make decisions on, on our own. And, you know, and if people aren't at the point where they're ready to eat healthy and affordable stuff, then we need to, then we need, then we need to meet that yes. where it is and then focus on how do we make sure that these are the, that kind of health um, and well being is something that we are demanding. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's a harder thing to solve. Than it's a much harder thing to solve. It, 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 it demands a change in a, a kind of education and a yes. change in thinking. When I live in Harlem and I remember 15, 20 years ago, there were food deserts. I'd have to go downtown yes. to get organic food or more fresh food. Yes. Um, but now farmers markets are coming in. They're all over the community. Yes. There are farmers in Pennsylvania, Long Island bringing things in and the supermarkets are changing. Yes. But here's another thing around a similar issue. Uh, last year, Whole Foods came to 125th Street and Lenox Avenue. And there was a mixed reaction to it. Some people feeling like, oh, it's gentrification. Here they come. That They never would have come here before. But a good friend of mine wrote something on Facebook, which I thought was fascinating. She said, well, why are you all acting like this? I like organic food. Yeah. You like fresh food. Of course we're happy they're here. Exactly. It's sort of like assuming, you know, it's this idea that, you know, 
we can't like nice things. That yeah. it's almost I think that poverty is somehow this cultural attribute. Yes. Like no, it's it's a state. A temporary one, hopefully, and actually there's data all about that, that actually poverty is actually more of a temporary condition than most people like to give credit for. Um, but it's sort of fascinating to me. It's like somehow or another that low status communities have to be considered deficient in some way and that all the good things in, in worlds are whether they're white or, um, you know, uppity or whatever. And I'm just, I find that so sad. That it goes back to what you were saying before that it doesn't have to stay that way, but there seems to be this assumption that it will. And that it's and it also that it should actually. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. So speak a bit more about how you're finding real estate as a uh, transformational tool. Mm. Well, we we realize that you know it is every relationship wherever you go is kind of based on real estate when it gets right down to it, <laughs> and it, it is very very true. You know where we're. Starting. What do you mean by that? Well. You know, where you live, you know, how you play, um, you know, where you work. It's all related to like how easily or not you can move through all those those kind of places. Right. And you know, preferably, you know, you do it in a way that makes you in a way that makes you feel like, oh, this is a great place to live, work, play, um, or getting there is an easy way to do that. So, you know, that in and of itself is as I think the core of what we're trying to do. And we're really focused on working in low status communities and using what's there because I honestly don't have a whole lot of confidence in the idea that there's going to be, um, even though there is policy to make it happen, um, you know, that there's, there's going to be a way to do mixed income uh, um, housing in wealthier communities. I don't see that happening. Yeah. You know, it's just, the, I'm sorry, we never had a truth and reconciliation committee in this country and bottom line is, People are racist and classist in, in communities, and we see that happening. So, but I do think that in in the possibility for doing this strategically in low status communities and doing it in a way where it's clear that the 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 added and better goods and services are actually are speaking to the people that are already in our own communities, because right. this assumption, which I also find very strange, that you know people in our communities don't want nice things you know like it's just funny we did an enormous amount of research when we even before we decided we were going to focus on our approach to real estate development we just asked we did about 500 surveys within the this this part of the south Bronx, and just asked people what are the kind of things that they wanted and aspired and to and needed in their own community you know just based on what they wanted and it was just just like that and what was so fascinating not to us but but it was, apparently it was interesting to a lot of other people, um, was that, guess what? People in low status communities like the South Bronx wanted the same things that people in higher status communities wanted. Yes. Imagine. Yeah. So things like, you know, they wanted, you know, great places to shop. They mm -hmm. wanted safe places to play. They mm -hmm. wanted housing that actually matched their income because there's also this assumption that everybody in a, in a, in a low status community is poor, which is actually not true. They, exactly. so they wanted housing to match their, their income. They wanted aspirational role models and examples in their own community, which we, we realized that we're not doing that. We're not retaining the talent in our own communities. We're expecting them to go as we talked about a little earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so we realized that we could actually you do that through real estate development. And so through our own capital, because there wasn't, frankly, a whole lot of people um, out there trying to support, you know, a, a fairly young black female new developer. Uh, so we had to capitalize it ourselves through our consulting practice. You know, we started doing things like opening up. Uh, we opened up a coffee shop. We acquired a little bit, uh, a small rail station where we hooked hopefully be opening up a, um, uh, a restaurant incubator that would support local Bronx chefs um, to actually do wow. their work and bring it to the local community. And, um, and we're also focused, trying to focus now on, on some of our first larger real estate development projects, which will bring you know, hundreds of years of housing and other mixed income economic developments here. Sounds exciting. It is. So do you still do the consulting? Do you travel around and, and help other communities do what you're doing? Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's at that, and I also speak it at a bunch of colleges around the country and, and also internationally. And that, that's actually a really wonderful thing to do because I feel like part of that 
you know, in addition to me sharing, it also, I always learn an enormous amount from that because people, they're, they're fascinating in so many ways. And especially when you see that their interest really is in doing effective community development. Um, you know, I think part of my, my goal and role as a consultant is to sort of shed light on what, what good they've already been doing yeah. and so that they can actually, you know, lift it up even further. In your international travels, have you seen other communities that are pulling together these same types of uh, ideas that you have successfully? Um, I've seen a lot. You know, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I've been to, um, you know, places as far away working with uh, uh, the, 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 the First Nations people in Australia, you yes. know, and, to, um, and hung out with, with folks, oh gosh, in uh, in. in various parts of, of South America and even some of the, the suburbs in, in Paris as well. Yeah. And seeing those places, um, you realize just how much we actually have in common and that is so much of it, it, it is about the status that we have as communities. You know, they may be of color, of color or, or immigrant communities, um, but it is almost always this, the same kind of issues that we're dealing with are all expressed around the, the way our land is, is, is used and or used against us. And so with that, in, in that it's, it has been a really extraordinary, um, I feel honored to have been included in so many of those discussions. What would you say to individuals to make themselves more empowered or aware about the connection between environmental issues and economic issues and location? Yeah. How can someone who's listening to this get well, more involved? Yeah, I mean, first of all, just understand that it's impossible to separate them yeah. um, with that because sooner or later, you're going, they're going to connect, you know, in terms of how that land eventually gets used and who does it get used for? Is it creating more you know, health and well-being, you know, and who is it creating health and well-being for? Because somehow it'll, it'll create some wealth for somebody. For somebody. Yeah, so that's, those are the kind of questions I think just people just listening you know, might want to think about. Um, you know, and for you know, developers, I think that you can do development in ways that actually bring, I think, a much more dedicated um, and supportive system to, to the developments you're doing. I mean, I don't think many of them ask enough. Well, they're, they're not incentivized to ask the, the questions about how do you do you know community development without doing harm to the to the communities you know and really also dealing with you know issues around uh gentrification which is such a hot button issue and it, i think it makes people flip out um without before even thinking about like you know it, because the real root of it is it's development and can we do development in a way that creates wealth and well-being for the a people who live people there still make a bottom line which is possible i'm absolutely convinced of it yeah so would you advise people to uh if they see new development coming to reach out to the developers or talk to their local representatives or what what could folks do i you know look well how did you start being a fire starter exactly you know what i i actually have been another kind of um, consulting that we're trying to work on right now is to help more folks be developers themselves. Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, that's, again, a part of what we've done, you know, in our own communities is kind of say, well, somebody else is going to do that. They should, they should. And I'm like, they don't, they, really? That has never worked. So stop saying that. But I think, you know, on some level, we need to be taking the reins of development ourselves. And I know that sounds really simple um, and simplistic, but it, but we have to start somewhere. I think that if, you know, local community groups were in, you know, instead, instead of just saying we need more money for a program, maybe pulling together and, and going to um, philanthropy and saying, you know what, we actually need to purchase buildings yes. so that we can actually build out the kind of housing and models that we need to see happening. Mm -hmm. Because it is, because the, again, that's the kind of strategic gift that keeps on giving. Churches, you could also you know, think about how do you maximize the land that you own now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, I'm from you know, the kind of family that, uh, you know, my father was, uh, was a Pullman porter um, for a while and many years and bought a house up here. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, my own family didn't keep the house. 
because after both my parents died because you know that most of my siblings didn't think that this neighborhood had any real value yeah yeah so even if we could just help people that own a little bit of their own land mm-hmm. and that like that is one of the major ways that people acquire wealth and keep it in our in our in our in our communities so let's start there and i'm not saying it's going to it's not the silver bullet or anything like that but some of us have literally got to start thinking about development and how we can take those reins why aren't we thinking about our communities you know from a development standpoint you know yeah. We can, you know, think about creating these our own the kind of institutions that are designed to create wealth in our own communities, so that we can afford to be generous and gracious, and we're not losing talent, and we're instead expecting it to reinvest in our own communities in ways that benefit us. And I think that that's that in and of itself. You know, I wish that everybody could feel something like that. Yeah. So making home really home for you. So where you live and where you work and the people that are around you, where you play, as you said, really fulfills and sustains you. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it really does mean, you know, there's, I'm super excited about this. Um, there's a, a saying that I've been known to say a lot called, um, you, you don't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better one, which I understand is actually on display at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History in DC. Oh, okay. I know I haven't seen it yet, but I will. Um, okay. But it is exactly that. Like, why are we constantly of the mind that somehow or another our communities are so deficient that they are going to stay that way. Mm-hmm. Like, no, like, why do we think that we, we don't, you know, and, and, if, and if just because some programs don't work, it means that, you know, the rest of us are just, we're, we're, well, we're just deficient. And yeah. that's just not the case. I mean, I really do think about, you know, Dr. King at the, at literally at the very end of his life and where he was. Right. Literally where he was, he was down in Memphis, working with black sanitation workers. They were, they were doing essentially environmental remediation jobs. Um, <laughs> and do, and but get it, doing the most dangerous part of, of the work, getting paid the least. So he wasn't just talking about racial justice. Yeah. He was talking yeah. about environmental issues. Yeah. He was talking about economic yeah. well-being. Yes. And mm-hmm. then he got shot. Yeah. So tell me what's next for the Majora Carter group. Next for us is um, working on our, our, our first project, which is uh, converting this rail station into uh, some kind of food-based um, gathering spot for the local community. So what do you mean rail station? It's a railroad station? It was, yes, it was actually, funny enough, the reason why my father bar- bought our house in this neighborhood, because there was actually a rail station here, because he was a Pullman porter. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and he was just like, great, that's the line I work on. So I'm going to be able to, instead of going all the way down to Penn Station, you know, in Manhattan, he'd just be able to get off to work. Exactly. So, um, but then, you know, the car became king and the rail stations closed down and that he didn't have that option anymore. But so it t- was turned to a little mini strip mall for a long time, Amtrak. Um, who owned the the property and uh, decided they didn't want it to be, they didn't, they decided to kick out all the tenants and I acquired it. And, and so again, this goes back to the research that we did. What were the kind of needs that were, that we needed in in this community that also could have an economic return on them that people wanted. Um, So we looked at creating more of a food hall uh, operation that would also support the uh, quite a low risk way for Bronx culinary talent to open up in, in, a, in a space like that. So that really is what we're working on right now and also acquiring some other parcels so that we can literally do a, a larger scale project um, for you know, at least 150 units of mixed income housing with a few floors of commercial that would allow us also to create more um, to, to more job creation because we again do the the analysis to figure out what are the types of economic growth trends so that we can use it, that space to attract them here so that there will be real business development and job creation. Um, we're we also rejiggering. Um, there's a we also run a, a tech social enterprise called Startup Box, and that is a market based solution. Uh, to the tech diversity problem, so to speak. But really, all it is is a business, a, a tech business that supports um, 
uh, software service development for area software development uh, developers. And, uh, but it also, on the, social, on the social side of the enterprise, provides um, an entry level job to, um, uh, to our two young people who want a first job in technology as well. So we're, and so we're um, reestablishing that program as we speak right now, which is very exciting. Well, I know this is an overused word, but there's something really holistic about what you're doing. I see the relationship between your own personal life with the rail station and the history of your family and your interests uh, in taking care of yourself and in your community, both environmentally and economically and through food and through place. It's really wonderful to see. And it makes sense that it's all of that encompassing. Yeah. So how can people work with you or engage you? Sure. Well, absolutely. Um, if you're interested in investing in a local tech startup that's actually headed by a woman of color, uh, definitely please be in touch with us. Um, the best way to reach us is actually through our website, which is www.majora, M-A-J-O-R-A, -A, yes. as in Jay-Z or the ex-president, whichever one you like, yes. and group. G-R-O-U-P dot com. Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I like speaking with you. All right. Thank you. So until next time, I'm Isis Arabe for the March on Washington Film Festival. March on, good people.